So Ikea knows something. Uh, Ikea knows something, you know, the big uh, store, the furniture store, and they name kind of bits of furniture after, you know, places in Sweden like Ektorp, right? And they have the cheap hot dogs. Well, you know, you go in, go in there, and, and Ikea is this really fascinating place, and you, you, they've designed it in a very specific way. Like, you have to follow, like, this one main trail. It's like following the yellow brick road uh, as you go through I- Ikea. And if any of you wear fit, you know, those... Fitbits or whatever the kind of track how you know you can't go into Ikea and leave without walking like 18 kilometers like it's an exhausting place to to go anyway this is by the way if anyone from Ikea is uh, you know great store you know don't sue me Um, but I I think it's kind of by by design in a couple ways because you go through there and what happens is you start walking and you you go in and you can't just go and grab the thing that you want right if I go to the grocery store I know that I can go to the dairy section for milk. I can go to aisle seven to get ketchup chips, right? Uh, but it, but an Ikea, like, you can't, you've got to walk past, unless you really know the floor design, you've got to walk through this kind of yellow brick road to get the stuff. And so what happens is you go in there for candlesticks and it's end up you coming out with placemats and, you know, a chair and a side table and everything else. So I think it's like by design, first of all, so that you see all this stuff that you hadn't planned on getting and some of which you will buy. But second is that as you go on, you get fatigued and you kind of get disoriented a little bit. And so your judgment goes out the window and, and you make poorer financial decisions. And so it's like by the, by the end, you're like, oh, where's the exit? Maybe if I buy this frame for over my bathroom sink, I'll get out of here sooner. It's like your judgment goes out the window. And so it's kind of like a, a disorient. Some of you love Ikea. You know, it's okay. That's nice. Um, but it's kind of like this disorienting and tiring experience. And the reason... I say this now is because I think we're kind of right now living through an existential Ikea. Um, this kind of invisible Ikea. It's like we're, it's disorienting. We kind of live in this tiring time. We're not sure when we'll get out of it. We're not sure totally where the exit is. The pandemic is coming to an end, maybe, but it's still continuing. Things that used to feel easy to do, actually feel harder to do. Many of us are navigating problems that we have to deal with in our lives. Uh, for us, parents, kids, friends that we didn't have to think about two and a half years ago, uh, we don't know where the exit is. And maybe some people wonder, how is everyone else managing? How am I managing? Are other people doing okay? Am I allowed to ask? Am I the only one who is struggling? Should I be struggling? How do I reshape and re-envision my life as I go forward into this next chapter when the future is so foggy? We're not really sure how it's going to evolve. Where's the exit? And so with these questions in mind, I think we really hear a positive word to us in James chapter, sorry, in John chapter five. And so we're going to continue with our look through the gospel of John. As I've said before, it's, it's most likely the most influential book ever to be written on earth. And so we've been going through the gospel of John kind of line by line, chapter by chapter. And we had gotten to the end of verse, sorry, chapter four, but then it came to Holy Week and Palm Sunday. So I jumped forward to chapter 12 uh, so we could kind of link up with the rest of the global uh, church. And then on Easter Sunday, we had the panel with Jen and Julie. And then I was away for two weeks. So now we're going to go back and start at chapter five and we're going to go through. So as I set this up, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, there have been seven signs, miraculous signs in John's gospel. Today's is the third. And these serve to, you know, they have a wow factor to them. Jesus is doing something incredible. It draws people's attention. Part of the function of the signs is that people deepen their faith in Jesus. We see how he is fulfilling uh, God's work in the world. We're reminded about all the goodness that is to come when the kingdom of God comes with power. So these are hope stories, um, and, and they really confirm our belief. But also at this point in the text, specifically chapter 5, and if you, if you read through the Gospel of John from, from first to last together, you'd see this. But right now, the hostility toward Jesus really starts to ramp up uh, a little bit, okay? So chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. And I've been reading from the NIV a fair amount uh, lately, but I'm going to read from the ESV, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, going to read to the end uh, of verse 18. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, or a festival, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Okay, so uh, right now we get into some really specifics, and this is one of the passages that remind us that this is, in fact, eyewitness testimony. 
eyewitness testimony. John demonstrates great uh, detail and, and accuracy of knowledge about what things were like in the first century around Jerusalem, Judea, with Jesus, etc. And this is one of those cases. So if you, had a, if you have a study Bible in the back and you could see one of those maps that say, this is Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, uh, you'll see that Jerusalem is a walled city. And so there's a wall around it and the gates could be closed at night, right, for safety. And also if there was some sort of threat of military invasion, um, the gates could be closed. And so the Sheep Gate is like on the east side, kind of more north, northerly, but it's on the east side. And the Pool of Bethesda that's named here, Bethesda means house of mercy. So it's appropriately named as a pool because people would go there for healing. They need mercy. They need compassion. It's right on the outside. Now, here's part of the interesting thing historically and archaeologically that I just have to share with you uh, from an apologetics perspective is that uh, for years uh, there was a certain group of scholars who said, you know, the Gospel of John, it's really, it's really philosophical, it's really theological, but it's not really that historical. Like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you can go to those Gospels for like historical details, but you can't really trust John in those ways because, you know, because of, of certain things and it seems more philosophical. And part of the reason some of them thought that is because outside of where the Sheep Gate was in the first century, people did these archaeological digs and they didn't find a pool. They said there's no pool there. And so if we can't trust him when he cites these geographic things, well, then maybe we can't trust the rest of the Gospel. Maybe we can't trust the Bible. But then in the 1900s, people did more archaeological digs and they went deeper. And guess what they found? They found the pool of Bethesda right where John says it is. Not only that, but they had discovered that it had five roofed colonnades, colonnades exactly like it is described. So a colonnade is like a row of pillars with a top on it. And so that's to protect people who have gathered from sun or from the rain or whatever. And so one around each side and one right through the middle, five roof colonnades, exactly like it was. Other people, previous generations had walked away from their faith because they're like, we can't trust this gospel. Then they just dug deeper and they actually found it. Uh, one of the people who was interviewed on the church's podcast called The Word at Westminster, if you haven't subscribed, you should, uh, was Douglas Rolvaga. And he was the, uh, one of the national moderators uh, of this denomination, the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Uh, he's a pastor in PEI. He leads uh, pilgrimage for people to Israel, and he's done this multiple times, so he knows the layout, knows the land. He recounted to me this experience of talking with a local guide, and this person was not a Christian, so they had nothing to gain by, by promoting Christianity. And uh, Douglas Rolvaga had asked him, he said, you know, where, where do you find these kind of historical things if you want to do archaeological digs? They said, well, we just read the New Testament. This is why. Well, because it proves historically accurate time and time again. So we just look up the New Testament and dig there. How amazing. And so uh, we just need to acknowledge that uh, there's a person named uh, Nelson Gluick, and he has said this. He's an archaeologist. says, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever contradicted a biblical reference. Isn't that amazing? So we just need to share that. And so then here we at the Pool of Bethesda. There it is, the five roof colonnades. They find a man who uh, is an invalid, it says. Now, we need to know that in the ancient world, they use more generic terms than we do now. So we don't know specifically what this man was struggling with. But he clearly, as the story shows, had some mobility challenges. Uh, the word invalid could mean kind of a, a general sickness or some sort of, of weakness. But he's also 38, so he's had this for a long time. And in the ancient world, that was longer than we... Today might think 38, okay, maybe a youngerish person. They're kind of getting close to middle age. They're not there yet. Dr. Craig Evans says that um, th uh, half of people died in the ancient world in this area before they were 30. Half of people died before they were 30. Plus, there's not the social sports that we had now, so this person is really struggling in a variety of ways. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed. At once the man was healed. Uh, and he took up his bed and walked. Pause. So a couple things. So the man doesn't even approach Jesus. Jesus takes the initiative and approaches him, which I think is just really interesting. Also, you get the sense from this man that he's not expecting Jesus to perform some miracle right then and there. There is this belief that, 
that when the waters in the pool of Bethesda kind of started to move and were stirred up, an angel had done so and they had these healing powers. And so you get the sense that he just wanted Jesus to actually bring him down because he didn't have anyone else to bring him down. That's kind of the sense you get. But Jesus says, take up your, your bed and walk. Now, it wouldn't have been like a queen-size mattress or anything like that. Uh, really, the word here is, it's most likely refers to like a straw mat, like something you could roll up and carry quite easily. Get up, take that, and walk. And Jesus heals him in an instant. And it's a beautiful story. There's a church father named Cyril of Alexandria who says in this story, um, in this story, we see not only Jesus care for this person because he physically heals him, but because this man was all alone. Didn't have anyone to help, but he was alone no more because Christ came along and attended to him. Continuing with verse 9, now that day was the Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh, controversy coming. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, and we need to remember here that when this phrase is used in the Gospel of John, it's not casting all Jews in a bad light. um, because Remember, Jesus and the first disciples are Jews. Uh, But here, this refers specifically to the religious leadership who is opposing Jesus. So it's a a specific group within Judaism. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Remember, Sabbath is, that's the day of rest. And so there's all these rules and regulations about what you could and couldn't do. The thing we need to know is that over time, additional rules had been added Rules that were not actually in the Old Testament. And so all of a sudden you get this whole group of people who can't see the forest for the trees. It's like a man's been healed and and they're worried that someone's like carrying their bat, for goodness sake. It's like talk about missing the forest for the trees. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Verse 11, but he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. I didn't do it. I got healed and some other guy did it. Verse 12, they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, and there was a crowd in the place. Okay, so we're going to pause there for a second. This is a big deal, okay? So we don't appreciate the significance and gravity of breaking the commandment uh, to, to not work on the day of rest, because we live here in modern North America, and the cardinal virtue is busyness. It's busyness, right? You ask people, and I've said this before, hey, how you doing? I'm good, busy, but good. And we say, quite often we are busy, but quite often we say we're busy as if it's like some sort of invisible badge of, of, of honor uh, somehow, like, like only busy people are important. Only busy people you know, know what they're doing or something. So, so we, we have this whole cultural predisposition against resting as if it somehow means unimportance or laziness, even though it doesn't. Um, So the command to rest is still very significant, but it was also very significant in the ancient world. Even today in certain parts of Jerusalem, right before the Sabbath begins, there's a kind of Sabbath police who go around with neon vests warning tourists to stop taking pictures because it's time to rest. So this is very serious stuff then uh, and now. Uh, George Swinnick, who's one of the the great Puritan writers, said he called Sunday the golden spot of the week. The golden spot of the week as we've talked about here, it's heaven's appetizer, right? It's a special day, but how, for how many people has it become just a regular day? Anyway, back to the story. Verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, the man who was healed, and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And Jesus will speak more specifically about being, uh, he and his father being one in John 10, verse uh, 30. So a couple of things here. Uh, they have this encounter again. Jesus is in the temple's precincts. Uh, Jesus sees the man, the man who has been healed, says, sin no more. Um, it's interesting. We're very politically correct today. We don't like to talk about sin, and we are certainly slow to warn people about sin. Jesus was not that way. He says, sin no more. This isn't to do with his, with his illness. Uh, the sense here is that, okay, you've been given this new life. You've been given this new chapter of your life. Make sure you are a person of repentance and you're not going to sin and you're going to live in faithfulness to God. So you really get the sense that that is what is, that is, what is happening here. Um, how tragic would it be if his body was well, but not his soul, right? So that's going on. And then the man kind of tattletales on Jesus. So it seems kind of weird. It's like, you know, he, he, you know he's healed him 
And all of a sudden, he finds out that the guy's name is Jesus who's healed him. And perhaps he feels intimidated by the religious authorities. Who knows? He goes and tells on Jesus, in a, in a sense. We don't totally know the whole picture or what the reason was. Goes, and then Jesus, when he defends himself against these people who say he's a supposed lawbreaker, he says this. My father is working until now, and I am working. My father is working until now, but I am working. And so the real issue is really that Jesus is somehow working on the Sabbath. Well, I think it's ironic here that Jesus has enabled this man to rest from his illness after 38 years, but Jesus is still called the bad guy. But there's something else happening beneath the text that we need to be aware of that's really significant, which is why they are so upset at him. So God also works somewhat on the Sabbath, on the day of rest. Right? So after creation, God rests absolutely. But even the ancient rabbis recognized that even God didn't totally rest. Why? Because otherwise the universe would collapse. How, how, how's, the, how's the earth going to rotate around the sun? How are the stars going to stay in place? How, how are people going to have the breath of life? Babies are still born. Stuff still happens on the day of rest. So God clearly is still doing some things on the Sabbath. And so because of that, when Jesus says, my father is working, therefore so am I, they realize and acknowledge Plus the fact that he's called God Father, that he is uh, speaking of, of a oneness between he, him and God. And they take this as blasphemous. Uh, and of course, uh, later they will take that up and notch it up to the next degree and as people seek to kill him. But this is why, part of the why reason it is so controversial. Um, as I was saying, this, something else just came to me. Uh, you know, God doesn't totally rest on the day. But since it's this day, kind of, moms totally never get a day off either, do they? But anyway. Uh, all right, so we're going to end our close look at the text there. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. That's about it. All right. So, you know, there's so much in this rich, te rich text. What is going on? What, what is a word that God might be speaking to us? Well, I think there's many things that, that we could look at. We could look quite simply at Jesus' power to heal, right? That's a powerful thing. Uh, we could rally around the hope that one day all pain, all suffering will end for God's people. This is one of those hope texts that tells us about that future. We could be encouraged by archaeological discoveries, Right? These things that keep happening, which, which confirm the, these stories as eyewitness testimony to us. We could put ourselves in the shoes of the sick man and think, okay, if Jesus were to approach us and say, do you want to be healed? What would we say? Right? We could kind of take it at that angle. We could think about Jesus, um, you know, his instruction to stop sinning, and we could explore that in our own life. Uh, we could unpack the implications of, of Jesus being equal with his heavenly father. And as I was first going through this and praying about this and doing the research, I thought, you know what, I think we should focus on uh, Jesus' defense of himself. He says, my father is working until now, and I am working. And then I thought, there's a lot there. Maybe that's a word for us. Maybe we should always be thinking about how is God working in the world? And since we are the hands and feet of Jesus, we should get in on the kinds of things that God is doing. And, that's, and we should. And that's, uh, I think that's a good application of this, of this passage. But the more I thought about it, uh, I changed my mind. And I wonder if uh, given all that we're going through in this fatiguing and disorienting time, that all that we're going through of human history, we just need the reminder in this text that God is working, that God is in fact working. And because of that, we can start to take some of the pressure off of ourselves and exhale. That we can start to take some of the pressure off ourselves you are in God's hands, not the other way around. You are in God's hands, not the other way around. I sometimes wonder, honestly, if our inability to just let our soul exhale and just to be, remember Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will sometimes wonder if our inability or unwillingness to just let our soul exhale and just be isn't because somewhere deep down we secretly believe and we would never tell anybody this, but we actually don't think God is doing his job. And so we got to do it. Know what you're thinking? You have much to do. That's what I think. There are tasks to complete, never-ending to-do lists, new problems to navigate that so many of us didn't have several years ago, futures to plan for, people to help, bills to pay, jobs to go to, things to worry about. But guess what? For the people of Christ, God is active and helping and providing strength and direction and wisdom in all of the situations you're dealing with to a greater degree than you are. Mark Batterson, the pastor, has said, when you add God to the equation, his output always exceeds your input. 
which means there's so many things in our life right now that we're screwing away and working away and, and we're, we're kind of just putting all this pressure on ourselves. God is actually more active in our lives and in the problems and the things that we are situ- and the situations that we are dealing with that we even realize. Inhale, exhale, because God is actually at work. You know, the previous book that we went through, Hebrews 1.3, uh, says the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact, represent, exact representation of his being. What is he doing? Sustaining all things, not some things. He's sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus stops doing that, everything collapses. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Speaking of the church's podcast, um, I recently interviewed the Reverend Dr. Claude Cox. Um, Claude's not here today, so I assume he's on the back porch at home with Elaine. Um, But Claude shared five bits of wisdom, five words of wisdom that he had uh, gleaned from people at Grove Park Home because he's been the chaplain there for a long time. And uh, he shared these five bits of wisdom uh, shared with some of the residents of Grove Park Home. And one person I said this to him, and this was kind of an expression, and and this is one of these five nougats of wisdom that Claude shared. You can only do what you can do. You can only do what you can do. Because there are so many times in our life when we think we need to do more than what we can do. Because maybe we got to make up for some ground that God isn't doing things. Children have it pretty good, don't they? Children have it pretty good. Uh, If you're like me, perhaps you long sometimes for a time when things were simple. Everything was organized for you. Right? Imagine your eight-year-old self, okay? And I know everyone's, you know, childhood wasn't perfect and maybe things weren't always great at home. But uh, imagine your eight-year-old self and you got some homework to do, but, but things for the most part on most days were, were pretty good. You know, you had a volleyball tournament in some town two hours away. You just had to get in the car at the right time and you just magically showed up the right place. You know, mom and dad reminded you to get your cleats or whatever. They, they, they made sure you had lunch. Someone made sure that the lights stayed on at your home. Someone even reminded you to make a card for mother on Mother's Day. All those sorts of things. Your only job some days was to be home before the street lights came on. Remember that? <laughs> be home before the street lights come on. Jesus talks about having the faith of a child. Mark 10 Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Maybe Jesus encouraged us to have the faith of a child because we need to, as adults, reassume a posture of total dependence on someone who isn't us. You know what kids are experts at? Receiving receiving. So maybe we need that reminder today that in the midst of our crazy lives, God is the one who is ultimately in charge in us, not us. He is working as Jesus has said. And everything that needs to get done will get done. Everything that needs to get done will get done because he is working. You are in God's hands, not the other way around. You can only do what you can do. So we're going to end this message in a bit of a different way. We're just going to take a few, uh, maybe a minute or two of quiet and uh, just pay attention to inhaling. And especially as we exhale, as we breathe, we're just going to think about how God is working, uh, how uh, all the things that need to get done will, and that we are in his hands and not the other way around. And at the, at the end, we're just going to sing a verse, general lead us in a verse and a refrain of it as well with my soul. So let's just inhale and exhale for a few moments together in the arms of God.
Just like sea.